Next question. Yes, sir. Our, our current voting system basically says that if you have three different political parties and uh, in, a, in a particular riding, one gets 35% of the vote, the other gets 30% of the vote, and you know, the two or three other political parties uh, split the rest. That person who only got 33% of the vote suddenly speaks for 100% of the riding. That's what the first past the post is. You know, whoever gets the most votes from a particular constituency, from their constituency, gets to govern, whether it gets to represent them. There have been a lot of questions about shifts to that, and I'm pretty pleased with the proposal that the Liberal Party of Canada put forward uh, at our last policy convention, which is basically around a preferential ballot. Now, the way that works is very simple. I mean, there were discussions of single transferable votes and other, you know, we all went through in BC and in Ontario uh, different elections about changing it. The nice thing about a single transferable ballot is it reflects the way we think as voters. We'll say, okay, I'm going to vote for the red guy because I hope the red team wins. But if it's not the red guy, I'd be okay if it was the orange guy, but I really don't want it to be the blue guy. Okay? So, you can reflect that in your voting. You can say, I'd like to have you know, the, the red person win, but if not, or you know what? No, I want to, there to be a green MP, so I'm going to vote for the green team. But if it can't be the green person, then I'd rather it was the orange person. And if it wasn't the orange person, I'd rather it be the red person. <laughs> See, it's sort of moving right there. But you know what? I'm going to rank <laughs> the blue person behind the communist, because I really don't want them to get elected. <laughs> Okay? What does that mean when they start counting the votes? Well, they start counting the votes, and okay, you know, the green party that was your first choice only got 5% of the vote. So, anyone who voted green as a first choice, you, know, you move down to their second choice. Oh, their second choice was the orange party. Well, the orange party, you know, got 15% of the votes, but it's the next one to drop off because the others were in the 20 to 30 range. Okay. So the orange party drops off. And then you go down to the red party, your third choice. And then your third choice goes through. What it basically means is political parties have an incentive to reach out to people who don't have them as their first choice. To reach out to people and say, you know what, I'm going to try hard and do a good job of representing you even if I'm not your first choice. And I really hope that you think that I'm going to be a good MP even because of that. And what it means is, Nobody can get elected unless they have more than 50% of the support of their riding. And that, to me, seems like an eminently reasonable change to our voting system that everyone could understand and that would lead to radical changes in the way we did politics because people who polarize would not be rewarded. People who instead try to bring together and accommodate and respect each other would be rewarded. I mean, honestly, it would make things a little more difficult for me in my writing of Papineau because I'm a very polarizing figure. Um, <laughs> but you know what? I'm willing to you know, take on a form of voting that leads us to being fairer, even if it means me having to uh, you know, win over a whole bunch of people, uh, because that's what I do professionally. <laughs> The job as a politician. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for your question. Next question. Yes. How can we make people more involved in the political process? That's a great question. Um, I am uh, official critic for youth, for post-secondary education, uh, and for amateur sport. And I deal with a lot of young people uh, in all those in all those roles. Uh, but the main role that I've had since I got elected. Uh, all the other titles have changed since I've been elected, but I've always been the youth critic for the Liberal Party. Uh, and more than that, uh, I am the only youth critic uh, that any political party has right now. I, although I think Elizabeth May might be a youth critic just because she's all critics for her party. Um, 
But the NDP, even with all the teenagers that they elected to the House last night, that's not true. They're all in their early, they're all in their early 20s. But anyway, with all those young people and with 78 critic portfolios that they put out, nobody in the NDP has the role of official critic for youth. And there's young people in their caucus and they sort of speak about youth issues, but there's no one there fighting for young people. And I spend huge amounts of my time crisscrossing the country, um, the riding, uh, connecting with people, but specifically young people. Chatting with them about the kind of world they're trying to build. Talking to them about politics, which they all go, oh, politics. I say, look, politics is just the way we organize ourselves. And the decisions we're making in politics are going to affect what kind of job you get, how much you're going to have to pay for your house, where you're going to have to live. And in times past, they even determined whether or not if you were gay, you were going to be able to love your partner and marry your partner. I mean, politics decides an awful lot. Young people care about this world we live in. They care about the planet. The fact that they don't care about politics is much more a reflection on politicians themselves than it is on young people. Because we have a generation of young people who are more interested, more knowledgeable, more connected with the world than ever before. The 24-hour news cycle, the thousands of channels on TV, the sum total of human knowledge now available to us at the, literally at our fingertips on our smartphones. And instead of feeling empowered by that, all too often they feel overwhelmed. How could I possibly imagine that I could make a difference in the world? Who am I to dare think that I might be able to bring peace to the Middle East? Or recycling to my town? Or composting to my neighborhood? Who am I to try and think I can change the world for the better? But you know what? They do. They try to get out. They get out in their community. Their schools, high schools have, and universities have more social action clubs than ever before. The level of young people engaged with this world through uh, you know, local initiatives, through bigger NGOs, is enormous. We have a more activated generation of young people than ever before. They still get a bad rap for being apathetic and cynical. And from time to time, we'll give you a secret. Young people are apathetic and cynical. But that apathy doesn't come from not caring about the world. It comes from being incredibly frustrated that they're not listened to. So they throw up their hands and disconnect. I think there is something that we can reach out and grab. I think if we look at the challenges we're facing, the shifts in thinking that are going to be required of us. Einstein once said, the problems we have created for ourselves cannot be solved at the same level of thinking that created them. Well, how are we going to challenge the status quo, the way things have always been done, unless we fold in the dynamism and the imagination of our young people, their capacity to embrace change, because that's all they've ever known, from elementary school to high school to moving off to university to starting up a family on their own. The transitions they're going through are enormous. And to draw on that, and fold that into the wisdom and the experience of everyone else and make smart decisions, including them, engaging them, and stopping to tell them that there are leaders of tomorrow, which is conditional, which says, you know, if one day you become important, you'll be a leader. And some of you might do that, so you're leaders of tomorrow. Instead, tell them they're leaders today and give them the tools to enact change today and to weigh in today in their community and in their world. This is how you empower young people. You involve them. Thank you for your question. Another question. Yes. One of, one of the great changes that we've taken on as a Liberal Party is something that no other political party has dared do in this country, and I dare say no other political party in this country could do, which is say, you know what? We're going to open up. In the past, 
Leaders of the party were chosen by delegates, selected by members, and sent to a convention. A few years ago, we said, you know what? One member, one vote. Every single member of the Liberal Party, that is, everyone who pays 10 bucks and becomes a member of the Liberal Party, gets to vote. That's what the NDP did in theirs. They had about 100,000 people voting. We're going one step further. We're saying, you know what? In the last election, two and a half million people, even in our worst election ever, two and a half million people plus voted for the Liberal Party. They're not people who'd feel comfortable having labels. I'm a liberal. They're not people who necessarily want to join and belong. But they're willing to support. They're willing to say, yeah, I believe in the principles that the Liberal Party stands for. I'm not one of the 200,000 Canadians who's an, active, uh, an actual member of another political party. I'd like a vote. I'd like to help the Liberal Party choose its leader. By opening up the most important responsibility the party has of picking who gets to carry us into the next election, who gets to be our prime minister, we're saying we care about ordinary folks who are not charged up about politics who are not super engaged, who don't listen to you know, Andrew Coyne and Katie O'Malley and, and Chantal Ibao with every single step of their day, like we do when we're very engaged in politics, who just want things to be better, want to know there's somebody looking out for them, somebody that they can recognize, somebody they believe in. We can reach out to millions of Canadians who will say, yeah, I'll support the Liberal Party and I'll help you choose your leader, <laughs> then when? Prime Minister Harper turns around and starts slagging our leader. There are millions of Canadians who will have chosen that person who will feel personally attacked for their intelligence and for their faith that this country can be better. And that is the kind of thing that excites young people, it excites you know, older people, it excites everyone to feel connected to the world that we are busy shaping with every single step of the way. One last question. Ma'am in the back, you had your hand up for quite a while. Go ahead. You get the last question. Sir or Justin, I would really, really like to see you become Prime Minister one day. Sorry. I'm sorry, no more time for questions. I hope some people remember come next election the 65, 67 thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, listen, I, I'm, uh, I'm flattered uh, and I'm very much glad that I'm part of a Liberal Party right now that for the first time in about 10 years or so, uh, more if you want to be ungenerous, um, has been ripped apart by arguing over who gets to be leader. Uh, for the past year or so, we've managed to put that completely to the side. I mean, the media is still spinning its little stories, but we've been focusing in rooms like this with people such as you on the hard work that we have to do all together to restore our party's systems, to restore Canadians and our neighbors' confidence in our capacity to succeed, and to remind people that it's not about picking the right leader and having everything fall into place. It's about how we pull together and connect. Because the Liberal Party, when we're at our best, will always be their best. And I'm glad to be part of it. Thank you very much.